Pauline Theology and Missions. In our last PowerPoint, we looked at the locations and cities of the second missionary journey. And today we're going to investigate the passages of Scripture that deal with the second missionary journey and see what the book of Acts says about Paul's second missionary journey. Stay tuned for the PowerPoint. Okay, class, we're now going to move into the PowerPoint portion of this lecture on Paul's second missionary journey, part two, and we'll be focusing in on the message of Paul. Okay, so when we looked at last time, we looked at uh, the beginning of the journey where Paul left uh, with Silas and they moved on to uh, Derby and Lystra. But we're going to look here just quickly at a very important time for Paul and Silas, and that is where uh, Timothy joins the team. So let's look at Acts 16, uh, 1 to 5. And he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of but by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in faith and increased number in number daily. So we see right here that Paul and Silas meet up with Timothy, and he wants Timothy to join the team. And so that's what Timothy does. And Timothy is going to become a very important personality uh, for Paul and also for the New Testament. And the letters written to Timothy by Paul uh, give a great de give great detail in regards to how the church should operate. And uh, as Timothy is a pastor, uh, these are pastoral epistles, uh, First and Second Timothy. Now, uh, Paul decides that he's going to take Timothy, but he wants to circumcise him first. And the reason that he wants to circumcise him is because his mother was uh, Jewish, but the father was Greek. So Timothy was never circumcised. Well, Paul decides to do this to aid in the acceptance by the Jews. So he's going to be taking these decrees that were decided on at the Jerusalem Council, and he wants the people to accept what was said and the decisions that were said, and he didn't want anything to hinder that. And so uh, Paul uh, circumcises Timothy so that he would be able to be more accepted uh, by the Jewish community. Uh, in verse 4, it does talk about the decrees to keep, and these were the decisions that were made uh, at the Jerusalem Council uh, between the first and second journey. Now, we will uh, get to that topic as a topic study here coming up in the future. We'll look at the Jerusalem Council specifically, uh, but I didn't want to interrupt the uh, focus of these journeys uh, just to talk about the Jerusalem Council. So we will get to that, but uh, this decision was made before the second journey began, and um, that he's going to take these decrees out. Uh, with him. So we see that uh, he, he gets Timothy uh, here at Lystra, and then they move on. Well, they move on, and we get to the Macedonian call, which we looked at in a previous PowerPoint. I'm not going to rehash that, uh, but we do know that he gets called uh, to Macedonia in the vision because the Holy Spirit did not want him to go to Asia or to Bithynia. But the team comes to Troas, and the Macedonian call occurs, and the team heads over to Macedonia immediately. So when they get to Macedonia, uh, we need to see what goes on in the city of Philippi. And we see this in Acts 16, 11 to 40. And we'll break this down first. We'll look at uh, verse 11 to 15. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of the part of, the Macedonia, of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who were there. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now, in verses 11 to 15, we meet this lady named Lydia. Now, she's from Thyatira, which is actually in Asia Minor. You can see uh, there on the middle of the screen, under Troas, right above the word Asia, we see the word Thyatira. And this is an, uh, a smaller region in the western portion of Asia Minor. And Lydia is there, and she is a seller of purple, which was a, a dye that was uh, from the Mediterranean region, and it was quite uh, expensive. So she would have been a, more of a wealthy woman. Obviously, she, she owns her own house that she can 
show hospitality to Paul and his team. And she was actually the first convert in Europe where it says there in verse 14 that she worshiped God. And then it says the Lord opened her heart. So we see that Paul is preaching and speaking to these women and sharing Christ with these women. And uh, she comes to accept Christ as her Savior. So she's actually recognized as the first Christian convert uh, in Europe. And also, she op- as I said, she opens her home, and this home becomes a base for the Apostle Paul. All right, continuing on now in Philippi, what's going on in this city? In verses 16 to 24, we see a confrontation that occurs between Paul and the masters of a demon-possessed girl. So we see this in verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes. That means Paul and Silas' clothes. And commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So we see here in this passage that I just read that this demon-possessed girl was making a lot of money for her master and was actually controlled by this demon who was speaking a message through this girl. But the thing was that this message was a message of truth. If you remember in verse 17 that I just read, the, the demon is crying out, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. So the message that is being screamed by this demon-possessed girl is a truthful message. But even though it's a truthful message, it was quite annoying to Paul that she just continued to do this and yell this out every time that Paul was there, which would have been a hindrance to the presentation of the gospel. So he needed to quiet her down. And uh, what does he do? He casts the demon out of her, uh, which is a miracle that God does uh, through the apostle Paul. So uh, now the people, the masters are very upset, and so Paul and Silas are arrested. And notice here, it seems that Luke um, is uh, is not there when the arrest takes place because they only arrest Paul and Silas. Or if if Luke is there, he's not the focus of, of the masters. So Paul and Silas are the only two that are arrested. And notice the accusations that come when this... um, this takes place, the accusations basically is the Jews versus the Romans. That's how it comes out. These men, this is verse 20, being Jews. So immediately they attack their Jewishness and uh, says that they cause exceeding trouble in the city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans. So now you have the Jew versus the Romans. And what do they do? They beat Paul and Silas and throw them in prison. Now we get to the account of the Philippian jailer. Verse 25 to 34 deals with the Philippian jailer. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword, and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them in that same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he had set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. So we see the Philippian jailer get saved. 
this man here, he has quite a responsibility. He takes his job very seriously. Not only were uh, was he handed possession of Paul and Silas, but then he goes and puts them into the inner prison, and even in the inner prison, he puts Paul and Silas in stocks. So he's very serious about his job and keeping them secure. But while in stocks, what are Paul and Silas doing? They're praying and they're singing and, and they're um, worshiping God, and other prisoners are listening to this go on, the Bible says. And suddenly an earthquake happens. And the doors open, and it says there in the word of God that everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from his sleep, saw that the doors were open. So now he's just scared for his life because uh, he believes that everyone has escaped. And if a jailer uh, fails at his job and people escape, uh, basically that's a death sentence for the jailer. Most likely the jailer would have faced crucifixion if the people escaped from his jail. So he would have been looking at death uh, there uh, by a crucifixion. So the jailer, he decides, you know what, I'm not going to be crucified, I'll just kill myself. But we see there in that t moment, Paul calls out to him and uh, the jailer sees that the people did not escape and so he cries out, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so that's what happens. In verses 27 to 34, we see the account where the Philippian jailer is saved. He believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and he uh, Paul speaks to the, wor the word of the Lord to him and to his household and his household believes and they're all baptized and we see hospitality given to Paul and Silas by the jailer. So we see the Philippian jailer get saved. Uh, but then we see also in verses 35 to 40, uh, based on this account, uh, Paul uh, leaning back on his Roman citizenship. Because as a Roman citizen, Paul has rights, and uh, uh, his rights were basically violated. And so uh, he's going to really press the magistrates, and the magistrates are scared uh, because of his Roman citizenship. In verse 35 to 40, it says, And when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers, saying, Let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now do they put, want to put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them to depart." So we see here that Paul's rights were violated. He presses the magistrates. You're not going to get rid of me quietly in, in some secret way. No, I'm, I'm a Roman. And, uh, and when they heard this, they were afraid. So it's just ironic how all of a sudden the tables are turned. They were beating them the day before they went into prison. And now on the other side of their release from prison, those same people are afraid. And they're pleading them and asking, please just leave the city. And so in the end, it was better for them just to go and move on. Uh, they spend some time with Lydia, and then they go and depart. Which now takes us to Thessalonica. In, verses, in chapter 17, verses 1 to 9, we see that Paul and Silas, they go into the synagogue, and they actually spend three uh, Sabbaths in a row at the synagogue. And what is it that they do? They preach the message. They preach the message of Jesus in the synagogue, and many believe. So if you look at verse uh, 1 through 4 of uh, chapter 17, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that, now here, here's his preaching, his focus of preaching, that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ." And some of them were persuaded, which means they believed, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas, which means uh, they, uh, they believed. But not everybody believes. So we praise the Lord that people got saved with that message. But in verses 5 to 9, we see that not everyone is going to believe, and there's some rebellion against Paul and Silas. In verses 5 to 9, we see the, what is known as the assault on Jason's house. Verse 5, But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathered a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out, of, out to the people. 
But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason was harboring them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So we see this assault on Jason and the other brethren there. Uh, the Jews, again, are envious. And so what do they do? They attack Jason's house, thinking that Paul and Silas are there, but they're not. And so uh, we have a trumped-up charge. It says that they turn the world upside down. It's just amazing how these evil men uh, exaggerate to try to get their way. Not only do they go get some bad guys in the marketplace and they rile up a mob, then they go and they say that they turn the world upside down. Well... The world to the Roman Empire was Rome and was centered in Rome. And there was no way that they turned uh, any, anything upside down in this city of Thessalonica. And they definitely didn't turn the world upside down from Thessalonica. All they did was preach Jesus and, a, and, and people got saved in this city. And so uh, there, there was these trumped up charges against Jason. And uh, the Jews sided with Caesar in this account. As you, as you saw in verse 7, Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. So now you have the Jews, who at different times were, were persecuted by um, the Romans, and not, in not too long, the Jerusalem will be destroyed by the Romans. But here we have the Jews siding with Caesar and saying that there's basically only one king, Caesar. So uh, what happens is uh, they sec get security from Jason, which means that after money was paid, uh, Jason and the companions uh, were let go. And Paul and Silas decided because of all this heat that's going on, it's best just to move on out of Thessalonica. So they leave and they come to Berea. And we see this in 17, 10 to 15. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those of Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Paul and Silas remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and received a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed they departed. So again, they start in a synagogue in Berea, and it says they're more fair-minded, or what it means is they're more open-minded to receive the gospel than those at Thessalonica. And it says that they examine the scripture uh, there in, uh, in verse 11, all readiness, and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So they examine the scripture. They were um, hearing Paul, and they wanted to know the truth. And so they looked at the scripture to see if it matched up, and of course it did. And so they examine the scriptures for the truth. Uh, many were saved, to include Gentiles. But we see again how the troublesome Jews uh, follow Paul to continue to stir people up. And so uh, while they're in Berea, some people from Thessalonica come from there and stir the city up against Paul. And so Paul leaves. However, Silas and Timothy stay for a time, and Paul moves on. And uh, Silas and Timothy will join up with him later. So what does he do? He moves on to Athens. In chapter 17, verse 16 to 21, we see, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue and the Jews with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the, the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. 
Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with the inscription, To the Unknown God. Okay, I'll just pause there for a second. So obviously he went to the synagogue in this very idolatrous city and to the marketplace, and he's speaking to people. Well, in verse 18, we see that he runs into two groups of philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics. And he deals with them, and he speaks with them. And when he does this, it, it brings... Uh, some some say, hey, he's just a, a babbler, which literally it's translated as seed picker, which means uh, someone that is, is idle, has nothing else better to do but go around and pick up seeds or scraps. And so some call him a babbler or a seed picker, while others say, hey, this is a new teaching and we want to hear more about this. Uh, they thought it was about a teaching of some other foreign god because they never had heard of Jesus or some resurrection, but now they're saying that it's, hey, let's let's listen to this. This is a new doctrine, and it's strange for us to hear this, so we want to hear more of this. As Luke says in verse 21, that they have basically nothing better else to do than uh, uh, to listen to new things that are brought into the city of Athens. So we see here the Epicureans and the Stoics. Well, on the screen we see a uh, definition here. The Epicureans, they attempt to live a harmonious life absent from pain, but also they were indifferent to pleasure. So it wasn't like they just wanted to live a straight up pleasurable life and, and be uh, hedonistic. What it was, it was more that uh, they wanted to have a balance in life uh, where you didn't have pain, but it wasn't an excess of pleasure. So that was the Epicureans. Uh, the Stoics, it was founded by Zeno, who was a philosopher, and it was a pantheistic belief that God is in everything. And one will be moral if they live by reason and in harmony uh, with nature. So they, these are the two philo philosophical groups, the Epicureans and Stoics, who Paul deals with in Athens, and they want to hear from Paul. So what does he do? So he addresses the Areopagus, which is a court. It's not a civil court in regards to the law. It's more of a philosophical court where people just get together and, and talk and think and reason. And so he addresses them. And what does he do? He preaches in verses 22 to 31. And I'm going to read through this quickly, but I put the points of his sermon on the screen. He talks about God as creator, that man is creation. He reveals God's character. He says, hey, you need to repent for salvation and that Jesus is the Savior. So in verse 22 to 31, I already began reading it where he gets to the altar of the unknown God. And it continues on, Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So we see uh, God as creator there, and he's, he's not... Uh, giving a history of the of Judaism or going to about the exile from Egypt or in Egypt or the uh, the exodus from Egypt and the wandering and the judges he doesn't talk about any of that with these pagan people instead he talks about what they would connect with God is creator he also brings in that he does not dwell in temples and and um, uh, made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands. So that's what all that happened in Athens. There were temples everywhere, and people were going around worshipping these these statues made by man's hands uh, all the time. And so this is definitely going to be something that the listeners are going to identify with. Then we get to verse 26, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries for their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each of us. So we see that man is creation and God has created him, has created man and that has put man on earth and they have nations and boundaries and that as as they attempt to try to find uh, find something with a false god, verse 27, it says, so that they should seek the Lord in a hope that they might grope for him and find him, to find the true God. 
As it says in verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So we see there some of God's characteristics, how he is not um, made of gold and silver and stone or anything like that. But instead, God has has basically had uh, patience with man uh, who is worshiping false gods. It says, truly, these times of ignorance God has overlooked. He is, he is giving man the opportunity to come to Christ, to come to repentance. They're in idolatry. They're in sin. And they need to call on God to be saved. And so we see here that Paul says, now, he now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who he has ordained. That is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Savior. So uh, he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So Jesus is the resurrected Savior. Well, so we see here the, the response. In verse 32, And when they had heard the, of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysus, the Arabicite, and the woman named Damaris, and others with them. So some mocked and some believed. But we see in this sermon that Paul preaches in Athens these points that God is creator, man is creation. It reveals God's character. One must repent, and Jesus Christ is the Savior. But then we move on from there and we go to Corinth. And in Corinth, we see that he meets up with two personalities, Aquila and Priscilla. It says, verse 18, 1, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy and his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Which means when he says persuaded, means that they came to Christ. So we see Aquila and Priscilla are here. They're Jews and they're tent makers. So Paul uh, finds commonality with them and, and uh, links up with them. He goes to the synagogue. And Silas and Timothy uh, show up on scene there in verse 5. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, remember he left them there, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So we see that the Jew, some Jews rejected Jesus, and so Paul moves on to the Gentiles. We see a couple of personalities here. Verse 7, And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then verse 8, we see Crispus. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So we see there that um, a Gentile gets saved in in uh, verse 7, and then Crispus, who's a ruler of the synagogue, who's a Jew, he believes. So we see Jews and Gentiles coming to Christ. Then in verse 9 to 10, we see the third vision of Paul in the book of Acts. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or hurt you, but for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So after this vision, this uh, promise from God that he'll be okay, uh, he stays for one and a half years preaching them. Then verse 12, we see a guy named Gallio. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be the judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things." 
So we see Gallio, he's the proconsul of the region, he's Roman, he's really just concerned about keeping the peace, where again, thinking about Pax Romana. So Gallio is like, hey, this is your religious law. I don't want to hear such things. Move on. Get over it. This decision is made. It says that Gallio drove them from the judgment seat, which basically means he, he whipped them out. He they was physically going in and whipping and getting the people out from the judgment seat area. Well, this makes the Greeks even enra more enraged because this Jewish law problem is brought to them. So the Greeks that are there, they're hostile towards the Jews for bringing this case uh, in into the court and, and it basically was a frivolous case and they didn't want to hear it so they grab Sosthenes who was the ruler of the synagogue so he's a Jew and they beat him before the judgment seat and Gallio he, he didn't care he took, took no notice of these things and and that's it so um, we see how Paul is protected by Christ that vision that says that Paul would be protected and they uh, in front of Gallio he, the case is not even heard so from there we see how he goes to Sancria in verse 18 of chapter 18 so Paul remained a good while then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria and Priscilla and Aquila were with him and he was and he had his hair cut off at Sancria, for he had taken a vow. So Paul goes there and he cuts his hair because he was under a Nazarite vow where he wouldn't, and now he was able to cut his hair. And then we see that he goes to Ephesus in uh, verse 19, which was his first stop in Ephesus. And, th and there he leaves uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, there, and we'll, we'll get back to Ephesus in the third journey. And then he goes and ends his journey by heading to Jerusalem, verse 21 and 22. But he took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, for I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus, and when he had landed in Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went to Antioch. So he headed back to Jerusalem, and then from there he went back to Antioch, which was the sending church. And there's not much great detail in those verses, just basically him traveling uh, there. Okay, so that is it. A, a look at the message of what takes place and just going through the scripture and looking at what takes place in the book of Acts during the second missionary journey. I'll see you in a second. All right, class, that's it for today. Next time, we're going to be looking at Paul's third missionary journey, and we'll be focusing in on the cities and locations that he travels to. See you then.